Hi, I'm Steve Clatton. I'm really excited and looking forward to my discussion with Russell Napier. Russell, welcome. What um, I would like to start off by, by doing is just painting the scene. Russell, you've explained to me in the past your views, which are quite radical, I think, about the forthcoming denouement of inflation, how equities will develop, how bonds will develop. Could you just briefly just paint a picture of, of your views? Yeah, I'll try and get it into a very short period of time so we can get on to discussing what it means for investment. But the simple way to explain this is that there have always been two ways of creating money. One is by a central bank, but most importantly, the other is by commercial banks. And the vast majority of all the money in the world is being created by commercial banks. Now, that sometimes that astounds people. But of course, the idea is that the central banks kind of control the commercial banks, and therefore they are in control at the rate at which the commercial banks create money. My entire thesis is that that changed in May. It changed April, May, and it changed through the use of what we call uh, government bank guarantee schemes or bank credit guarantee schemes. And it sounds like a very technocratic not very interesting, not very important shift, but actually it's fundamental. Uh, and last week, the uh, European Central Bank recognized this and they call it the sovereign bank corporate nexus, which is a classic piece of euphemism for the fact that money is now created by governments, not by central banks. Now, I can't persuade anybody of that, even though the ECB has now come out and said it as well. Uh, because once a government is in offering that guarantee to the bank, the bank begins to lend money. And we've seen spectacular uh, growth in bank credit in this you know, biggest recession in this country, this country being the United Kingdom since 1708, fastest bank credit growth probably we've ever seen, or certainly one of the highest we've ever seen in peacetime. How on earth do you reconcile those? The government guarantees it. So when those bank loans are made, money is created. And that has been the failure of central banking now for 12 years, that they absolutely failed to do that. They, they created a lot of their type of money, which is technically called a bank reserve and sits in the, in the banking system. But they didn't create a lot of what we uh, call our type of money. And by what I mean our type of money, I mean citizens, people who spend it, the stuff that we pick up in GDP and measure in GDP. And my goodness, the governments are doing a spectacular job at creating that. So to give you some numbers, the growth in the total number of dollars in the world is up 25% year on year. Uh, for the yen, we're looking uh, about 9% year on year. Uh, for the euro even, we're getting to 10% year on year. Uh, and these numbers, these growth rates have all doubled or tripled during COVID-19. So the first point is that it's a new mechanism. It is working. Historically, that level of money supply growth would normally create inflation. And there's a bit of People doubt that, but at that very high level, it's almost certainly the case. And then the second part, Steve, which we will no doubt talk a great deal about, is that that leads us to a time when bond yields are capped, when the state central bank regulator does not allow the bond yields to reflect the inflation outlook. And that is something called financial repression. And it leads us down a rabbit hole for a generation of government control mechanisms to try and force savers to own an asset they don't want to own. And if I started to talk about that in detail, it would take me 90 minutes. But uh, that is the outline of two things. One, inflation's coming because the control of money is coming, but it takes us to a world where we have to control the yield curve. And that takes us to a thing called financial repression. And then we're definitely not in Kansas anymore. Before we go down there, I mean, the, the, the way I look at this very simply is that the governments have got a lot of debt, they need to keep interest. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important, is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. Before we go down there, I mean, the, 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 the way I look at this very simply is that the governments have got a lot of debt they need to keep interest rates very low. And therefore, if we do get inflation, we're going to be in a period in which there's negative real interest rates and 
large. And that means that anybody that's trying to protect their wealth will have to seek to borrow money, which means that there will be a huge demand for credit. And that's why the rationing will have to take place. Is that? That's absolutely right. And that's a brilliant word. Rationing is a brilliant word and a word that most people watching this will never have had to live with. And people will think it's an alarmist word as well. But let's be clear what rationing is. Rationing is the allocating of resource by a mechanism other than price. So don't think of World War II. Don't think of queuing up to get two eggs. Think of a, a means of allocating anything by a mechanism other than price. So you're absolutely right. When you get negative real yields, we'll all want to borrow, really. I mean, if my wages were going up at six, why wouldn't I want to borrow at two? And if I was a corporation and my revenues were rising at seven or eight because I was getting uh, price rises of six, of course I'd want to borrow at two. So we have to put in place administrative restrictions on this. And I, you know, of all of the many, many things we could discuss, this is probably one of the most important because we've lived in an era where anybody could get credit. Dogs got credit. At least they were mailed credit card application forms. Uh, at, at a right price, anybody could get credit. And the world is geared for that reason. And just one thing I'd correct you on is, yes, it is about government debt to GDP being high, but actually the private sector debt to GDP is at a record high. At least government debt to GDP may be slightly lower than World War II in some countries, but the private sector is at a record high. So just imagine a situation where we have to undo this, unstitch the past 30 years to get debt where we need it or want it to be. How much debt will flow to private equity? How much debt would flow to allow you and I, if we ran a corporation, to buy back our own equity? How much debt would flow to gear up commercial property? In fact, what you, what you might argue is that the government divides rationing, good credit and bad credit. The bad credit would be gearing up an existing in income stream, and the good credit would be building an existing income stream, because in building an existing income stream, we have the prospect that we're going to employ people. So, yeah, you, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. And as a stock selector, of course, that has huge ramifications, because if you can find the stocks that get that really cheap credit, there is potentially extremely good benef benefits for the equity. But if you are in the stock already, which has all this credit and basically can't renew it and has to go for equity funding, then we're going through a very prolonged re-equitization, which I would argue is probably not good uh, for the price of that equity. But you're the micro specialist. So what do you think? Well, that is an interesting question. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, because this idea, if we've got inflation, well, theoretically, if governments are trying to inflate away the debts, it might be a good idea to own leveraged companies. But if they can't refinance the credit, that's going to be a real problem. But before we get on to that, there is one sort of pushback I think people will have to this idea, we're going to have inflation. And that pushback is, well, governments have wanted inflation for the last decade more, and they haven't been able to get it. So why are you so convinced that now is the time? Well, I need to give you a bit of my a little bit of my own history here. So when we got to 2009, when I became a, a bull of equities, I said, this is going to create inflation, this quantitative easing, and you should own equities and commodities. And of course, they both went up and inflation actually went up. So inflation did get quite close to 4%. But in 2012, I completely changed my mind and said, we're not going to get inflation. We're going to get deflation. Now, it took a while, but as early as 2015, America was actually again reporting deflation. So why, as you say, given that governments have wanted it for so long, given that central bank balance sheets have gone like this, why didn't they get it? Because they didn't create the sort of money that circulates in the things that we call GDP. What that activity by the central bank acting alone did is it was buying effectively bonds from savings institutions and crediting the savings institutions with cash. You and I have both worked for savings institutions, so we know that the only thing a savings institution can do with that is buy more assets. It can't buy a Lamborghini. Despite what you read in the press, the fund manager can't take the money and buy a Lamborghini. So the money we're creating today is of an entirely different sort. And if, you, if we look at these loan programs, they've all really gone to small companies rather than big companies. This is the ones that have come through the banks rather than the bond market. And I mean, very small companies, you know, taco stands, Uber drivers, these are the sort of people who are getting this. And these guys spend the money. They have to spend the money to survive. And they're going to spend this money. So to me, the fundamental difference is that, and it shows up in the data. So the, the crucial data, let's take Japan, the infamous Japan where there's been no inflation for, or um, well, back since the early 1990s. I think it's about 2% that broad money growth has averaged in Japan over that period. And all the incredible things the Bank of Japan has done, it's been 2%. 
Well, we're up at, depending whether you go for M2 or M3, we're up close to 10% today. Now, you can either say that's irrelevant and it doesn't make a difference, or you can say that's it, the world has just changed. And to me, it's, it's that is what changed and who has that money, and it will be spent in GDP. Uh, and that's why after many, many years, uh, I'm looking at a little thing I wrote on the wall. I have it on the wall because I wrote it in 1996. It was called Dealing with Deflation. So, I mean, it's something I've been aware of since 1996, and every recession we've had since 1996, it has tipped us towards either into deflation or fear of deflation. Uh, so here I am sitting to you after writing about that now for over 20 years to say that it won't happen again, that, that, that this has fundamentally changed because of how money is created and whose hands it is in. Okay, so let's. our working assumption is that you're right and that there will be inflation. We don't want to risk everything by betting that 100% that you're right and just going and buying gold, putting all our assets into gold and into gold miners, which would be the simple solution. So let's just explore, okay, let's put some of our assets into gold and gold miners, but what do we do with the rest? So the, the first thing was to think about companies that are heavily indebted. And that's risky because obviously companies with a lot of debt will have to refinance at some point. Your theory is that they'll just come up against a roadblock and they won't be able to borrow the money, either because the central banks will ration the credit or because the credit markets will charge them a heinously high price because of that, because of the risk that they won't pay and because they want real interest rates. Is that fair enough? Well, I think the first one is fair enough, and the second one I'm going to I'm going to differ on. So on the first one, absolutely. But remember, the world is being divided into good and bad. So we can find the corporate that's allowed to access that credit because it's considered that that credit is for a socially useful purpose. Then things may be fine. I think it's it's very clear that green lending is going to be one of those socially useful purposes. Another one is definitely building residential real estate. Uh, you know, that is the American dream. It's not just the American dream. It's a dream for most people in the world to own their own homes. That's going to be good credit. There's lots of reasons why you might look to invest in, in companies like that that get access to the good credit. The second point was uh, corporates are going to be starved because the yield they'll have to pay to go into the, the non-bank market will be excessively high. I think that's really interesting because in my book, I looked at 1949 as one of the great bear market bottoms. And of course, that's a period of yield curve control when the government is, or the central bank is actually keeping yields at a certain level, the arbitrage, the necessary arbitrage, if you were a savings institution, actually kept corporate bond yields pretty close to that yield. That worked as an anchor, worked as an effective anchor. Now, it has to be said that most corporate balance sheets in 1949 were in a hell of a lot better condition yes. than they are today. But, no, no, but, but, but on that second bit, the fundamental way we did this after World War II it was not via market system at all. So the United Kingdom had a thing called the Capital Issues Committee. And the Capital Issues Committee, if you and I wanted to issue a bond or debenture, as it was called, to raise this money, let's say to build office, office properties in London, it had to be approved by a committee. And if the committee didn't approve it, there wasn't any price that we could issue at. We, we didn't get a license to raise capital, so it didn't really matter. And I think you know most people will think that's extreme, but, I, but in November last year, the Bank of England, Her Majesty's Treasurer and the FCA announced the committee that is going to work out what productive investment is. Now, we just have to wait and see what that means. But, but it, when the government starts drawing a line between productive and non-productive, we could well be morphing back into that committee. So, so you're absolutely right. If, I, if you and I run a company, which is just not getting credit at any price, then it's a forced re-equitization. And that is not going to be good for the uh, return on the ec- on, on ec- uh, the, uh, the return from investing in the equity. Probably not going to be good for it. But the post-war period was characterized by a limited amount of, of, of trade. I mean, we're in a much more global world today. So the Bank of England can say to all the banks, well, you're not issuing, you're not issuing loans to real estate developers. Real estate developers is just going to go to a Cayman Islands entity and, and issue a bond. I mean, how, how can the government, I mean, even if the government collude, can they stop? Global finance? I mean, I, I, I don't see how that's possible. So it is possible. And in recent times, lots of people have done it. Of course, the Chinese do it. They don't do it very, I mean, they don't do it with 100% success, but they do it with significant success. And that's not just significant success in stopping capital coming out. 
It's also a significant success in stopping Chinese corporates borrowing overseas and bringing it in. I mean, that got out of control up until about 2014, and they brought it back under control. Of course, the ultimate control is capital controls themselves. And people say, well, that can't happen. The technology is so wonderful. We have Bitcoin. It'll never happen. Well, then someone better explain to me how Iceland, Greece, and Cyprus have all had capital controls within the last 10 years. They've, they've had them and they've removed them. Uh, they're quite common in emerging markets where they, you know, they work to a certain degree. But even three of the, you know, three, we can't call them major countries, but three developed world countries uh, have run these capital controls. It is very difficult to do if one country was kind of, if you like, bankrupt or over leveraged and had to do all this in isolation. But when you look at the data, everybody's in the same boat. I mean, China is the only emerging market that's really geared. All the developed world is really geared. So there is a, a, a reason why they will cooperate and just some evidence of that, which has existed before COVID. The OECD has been forming a group for a couple of years to try and work out what they call base erosion profit sharing taxation which is the stuff we all know about that, you know, every company, every you know, Starbucks has a Belgian or a Dutch subsidiary and, it, you know, they, they pay a license for marketing and all that stuff. We, as a, we, I say we, as a developed world group of companies, we're working on that even before COVID came along. Uh, the secret of taxation is to extract the maximum amount of feathers with the least amount of hissing. And when governments can collaborate, then, because they all need the tax revenue, then I think these things become uh, much more possible. So it may not be as strict as the post-World War II situation, but that's not the point. The point is it's going to be radically different from the system that you and I spent, have spent our careers in. I think this is an important point you make because we've had, what, nearly 40 years of falling interest rates. And they're now, they can't fall any further unless you believe that they can go to negative five, which I suppose is a potential, I mean, you can't say it's impossible, but um, it's probably less likely. So I think everybody that's operating in, in markets today has to look with a very different lens because you can't look back at history and necessarily conclude that this is what's going to happen in the future. And I think you've actually really got to think a lot, lot more radically and start with a blank sheet of paper and think, OK, so we're going into an inflationary environment. Let's say there are capital controls. How does that work? I'm sitting with Apple shares. Hmm. Apple buys its products from China. It pays huge amounts of money to Foxconn. It sells huge numbers of iPhones in China. It's got a service platform operating all around the world. Well, does the cash have to stay in China or wherever? I mean, how, do, how will it work? Yeah, so that's not, so where you begin with is you stop capital outflow. And you try to divide this between capital outflow and outflow associated with trade. So I'm not saying that it works, but this is where you begin. So you don't want to disrupt trade. Trade is a good thing, keeps people employed. So somehow you can say to a corporation, if you're Apple and you're moving six billion offshore to buy something in Europe, that's not allowed. We all uh, we want to at least have a look at that. But if you're Apple and you need to move some working capital to China to do some trade, that's a different thing. Now I think we both know how difficult that will be, but that's how it, that's how it works. All the money that Apple has offshore, of course, it can bring back to America at any given point in time. Capital controls are like a lobster pot. You can always bring money in, always. It's just that you can't take it out. Now, there may be a few companies that, that are really just struggling with far too much capital coming in. Switzerland is already in that situation, I suspect. Singapore could be there. So there, there might be a few companies that will try and stop you taking your money in. And we can talk about how you do that. But for most countries, it's not allowing you to take money out for the purposes of capital investment. And that's where it begins. But it becomes a giant game of whack-a-mole because everybody finds ways of arbitraging that, as the Chinese do. And then the government chases everybody around trying to make sure that it's not uh, transfer pricing or whatever else. So that's that's the mechanism where you work down. So you start with this sort of, you, you target a tier, but by definition, it, you spread down through, through, through the system. And you probably know that in the, at 1960s, I think the maximum amount of money you could take out of the United Kingdom was 30 sterling. Now, I, I mean, I'm not saying we're going to get to that level, but uh, I keep recommending that everybody goes and reads uh, Graham Greene's Travel with, Travels with My Aunts, which is a novel. Uh, and I don't really want to give too much away because I'll ruin the entire novel, but it tells you something about capital arbitrage in the world of exchange controls. That's all I will say, but uh, he's, he's a great novelist, so worth a read. Well, you weren't allowed to take out more than a certain amount in cash. But if you were going for a long holiday, it wasn't enough to finance your holiday. So everybody took 
more, right? And they, I mean, they didn't search you at the airport, or maybe they did. That's what I mean about arbitrage. Uh, it turns out that your grandmother becomes an arbitrage and uh, arbitrage heir in such a in such a system. Uh, the Bank of England had a huge department, Steve, and that's what. So if you you and I wanted to move money out of the country, we filled in a huge form. It went to the Bank of England. I mean, I can't remember the numbers, but there was something like eight hundred people in that department, and it basically closed down overnight. Jeff, Sir Jeffrey Howe stood up. I think it was nineteen seventy nine. Said there won't be any exchange controls tomorrow morning, and all eight hundred of them had to go home. So you know, it was a really big industry approving our movements in, in capital. Uh, and the other interesting thing about that is because a lot of people, when the capital controls came down and they came down here in 1939 for obvious reasons, what happened is that in your foreign assets, they went to a big premium. Because if if I was in London and I owned some shares in New York and you wanted to invest in New York and I said, Steve, you've got to pay me a premium. If you want to have this dollar denominated asset, you got to pay me a premium. So that's a simplified way of doing it, but a thing called a dollar premium developed, which you could get your money out of the country if you like, but you, it was certainly wasn't at the prevailing exchange rate. It was at a significant premium uh, to that exchange rate. So that presumably is what we should be doing right now, is to protect ourselves. If we believe that capital controls are coming, we're sitting in the UK, where should we put our money? Singapore? Switzerland? So the definition of who will, have to, who will not have to put in uh, financial repression are countries with low debt to GDP ratios. So that's where we start and, and we say, are there any are there any of those? Well, the only ones in the developed world uh, would actually be Germany and Austria, but, but they are now irrelevant <laughs> given that they are part of the European Union. So it's not Germany and Austria, but, but Switzerland is all right. Singapore is probably very good. Uh, the fascinating thing, however, is if you look at countries with low debt to GDP, with the exception of China, they're all in the emerging markets. Now, if I said to you that we need to put our money into Mumbai to avoid financial repression, I think it will be deep, deep skepticism. And policymakers in India are, let's just say, they can be unpredictable. So I'm not suggesting, you know, as you said, you don't want all your eggs in one basket. Uh, but there are reasons, I think, where we should be looking to uh, emerging markets. Now, I, for me, that's not yet investing in the equities. There's a a change in relationship between the West and China coming, which will be deeply dislocative for emerging markets. But there is a prospect that emerging markets can do well. Let me, let me give you two historical examples. Switzerland after the war was a, was a brilliant place to, to avoid financial repression. For very obvious reasons, Switzerland didn't have a lot of debt at the end of World War II. It was a non-belligerent. Uh, therefore, even just putting money in the Swiss bond market, uh, you made money from your bonds in Swiss franc terms but actually you made a lot more in your exchange rate. So that was a good place to be. But I think the really peculiar one is Hong Kong, uh, another country that didn't have, or not country, colony that didn't have a lot of debt uh, after World War II for, for obvious reasons, given they've been occupied by the Japanese. Uh, they did not endorse financial repression. It was famously run by a British civil servant called Sir John Cowperthwaite, who shunned financial repression and uh, pursued a kind of more free market approach. That, that turned out to be a wonderful place to make money in the kind of 40, 50 years after World War II. So we're looking for those. But see, that, I, I raise Hong Kong because who would have thought of it? You know, if I'd said to you in 45, Steve, you know what, London, and now London had been the financial capital of the world really until 1914. Get your money out of London, put it in Hong Kong. You say, you must be nuts. And not only that, it's got all these communists just north of the border. So when you said, let's start for the, with a, a, you know, a, a, a blank sheet of paper, when it comes to a world like this, we do need to start with a blank piece of paper. So, so personally, although it's not a huge amount, I think investing in India is probably one of the better better things to do. And that will sound radical to many people. And to be to be sure, not a huge percent, but it seems to me that there are Indonesia. I've just made an investment in Indonesia. Seems to me for all the trials and tribulations that Indonesia faces, a need to financially repress will not be one of them. Well, I'm glad you said that because India um, is actually one of my biggest country exposures. So, in my equities portfolio, so I, you know, I believe I, I believe in it not because of what we're talking about, because because of fund fundamentals of the of the country. The the one thing um, I'd like to explore on the subject of inflation, and you know, many of the people watching this will almost have no idea what inflation is. I mean, I can remember. As a child, not as an operator in the stock market, I can remember inflation. What do you think about what sort of investments people should be looking for? And one of the one of the things I wanted to talk about was 
if you look at what will work in a period of inflation, it should be pricing power. But when we talked about this before, you said that in an inflationary world, everybody's got pricing power, and what you need to have is cost control. And I thought that was a, it, it was quite a funny comment to me. I mean, what do you think about this? I mean, obviously, if you've got real pricing power, that's the best protection against inflation. How do we look for companies with cost control? Because it's something that people have paid much less emphasis on in the last 10, 20 years. Yeah. So, well, my personal experience of the 70s was my father was a butcher. So I used to work with him in his shop. And every Monday morning, the first thing we did every Monday morning was wipe down last week's prices <laughs> and put up this week's prices. I think UK inflation peaked at 22%, but meat inflation was running at a much higher rate. So I have a very, I remember very well going into a fish and chip shop about five years ago and, and noticing for the first time that the guy who owned the fish and chip shop had, had bought a pricing board where you couldn't change the prices. All the prices were kind of, he paid up, so it was all done nicely. And I thought, well, that tells you in my lifetime how we've gone from wiping them down every day to a complete belief that prices could could never go again because you paid for, for uh, you know, permanent prices there. This is the issue with stock markets, isn't it? They discount. So you're absolutely right, right to say pricing power is a good thing to have in a period of rising inflation. You know that That's obvious. But what we've got in a market today is an entirely bifurcated market. You just mentioned 40 years of disinflation. So you have very high valuations for companies with pricing power. Moats is another word that the uh, the sage of Omaha calls them. You know, it's you know everybody knows that you pay up for the moat, you pay up for the pricing power. In other words, I think it's in the capitalization of the price. And then we have this other class of stocks, and let's let's just call them value stocks because I think everybody can kind of close their eyes and see the price chart. And we know that the value stocks are languishing down here with one of the worst ever performances ever relative to the so-called growth stocks or pricing power stocks. And then we wake up one morning and let's pick a number. I don't think this is coming that quickly, but let's say we wake up and inflation is five. What that kind of means is everybody gets to put their prices up by five and some people get to put their prices up by more. Now, all these stocks down here, which have been hated because they've been price takers, they're still price takers, but they just had to take a lower price or virtually no price rise for 40 years. Suddenly they're price takers at 5% higher up. What does that mean for the A? What does it mean for their valuation? Just that they're suddenly enfranchised to get a higher price, not because they're brilliant businessmen. It's just that's just what happens in an inflation. I think that is positive for the earnings. But now the second thing is the one is the thing you raised about cost control. There are some people who just get cost control naturally. They, they don't have to be geniuses either, and that's because so much of their costs are fixed. And we've discussed this in the past. Depreciation is an obvious one. There's these operating leases, which is another obvious one. Uh, there is uh, interest if you have sort of borrowed far into the future on a fixed coupon. That's also a fixed cost. So I am fishing at the bottom for those types of stocks. I, they have natural cost control because they've got a lot of fixed cost. But also, and crucially, the valuations write down because everybody thinks these guys will never put their cost ups, prices up ever again. Therefore, they're worth X. This guy can, has been putting his prices up at 4% per annum for 20 years. Therefore, I pay a premium and a valuation up here. And all I'm saying is it will narrow and it will narrow. And therefore, the risk there's more risk in these guys than there is in, in these guys. I mean, this is what makes it so fascinating, isn't it? Because people have been conditioned for years and years and years to look for those stocks with economic moat, to look for stocks with high returns in invested capital. And if we're going into a period in which there's consistent high inflation, those stocks, perversely, those stocks with very low returns in capital may actually do quite well. Because if you need to have a lot of assets, whether it's fixed assets, I remember in in the 1980s, there was current cost accounting. And what they did with current cost accounting was that there'd been such high inflation they looked at the assets in the balance sheet at a replacement cost value because assets which were very old were generating extremely high returns in capital. So perversely, those heavy capital intensive industries, which have very low returns, could end up seeing their returns grow much faster than the ones with very high returns. Is that, is that something you agree with? 
Yeah, it's something I agree with. And then when I when I agree with that, people say, oh, but there's the reinvestment rate. There's the money they have to put back into the assets. So I want to tell you a story about my visit to Santiago de Cuba in Cuba. In uh, I think I went in 1992. And that is where the old Bacardi distillery is. And it's still making rum. I don't think they're allowed to go I, mean, I don't know what the Cubans call it. Obviously, the Bacardi family and the Cubans have got a few disagreements, but it's still there and it's still producing. And Cuba's most famous for those old automobiles that are still managing to trundle along the roads, whatever it is, more than 50 years ago now. Well, the distillery is still working. So it has been possible with virtually no reinvestment to keep a distillery running from whenever the revolution was right up until today, producing rum. So I, I understand that that's not the ideal way that one would produce rum. One, one would put some reinvestment back into that distillery. But still, it is possible to run a large fixed asset with a minimal level of reinvestment. So the price of reinvestment, which is obviously going up in an era of inflation, isn't really massively uh, undermining, undermining your returns. China plays into this a lot. The people that we're talking about who have those big fixed assets, many of them have suffered from Chinese competition. Uh, and one thinks of shipbuilding or, or steel, uh, things like that. Now, this is a different conversation, really. But if we believe that China is being increasingly ostracized from the global trading regime, this also lifts pressure from that type of company. Uh, and when I look at where all of these things cross, I keep looking at Japan. Now, uh, you know, I get a lot of kickback on that. People aren't so keen on the idea. But if you say to me, who's really got cost control? I think the people who've really got cost control are the people who've been under the cosh for 30 years. And they've learned how to do it. And they will now be rewarded for it in an era of inflation. So I think we should be looking up at uh, Japan. You are the micro expert and on valuations. The valuations look reasonable. I mean, when you look around the world, you see a lot of unreasonable valuations. I think you can find some reasonable valuations up there. And I think that is more likely to be the benefit from inflation and those. And it's been heavily hit by trying to compete with China. You know, we, we attribute the deflation to many, many things, but I don't think we pay enough attention to just how much damage has been done to Japan through competition with China. No, absolutely. And there's lots of there's lots of cheap stocks there. And I mean, I, I agree with you. There's lots of roads point there. The other thing I think is quite interesting, just talking about low returns in capital, which may rise in an inflationary environment, is companies with high, very high stocks. Because one of the things that people won't necessarily remember is that if you've got very large inventory, as you reprice the meat each week, as you reprice the products each week, you end up getting a gain on holding inventory. So again, perversely, the low, it, the low return stocks, because they've got high inventory, will see the greatest benefit in their earnings in an inflationary environment, which I think is something that people may not necessarily, it's not an obvious conclusion. And what this tells me is that maybe we need to throw out a lot of our existing rules because, you know, everybody's doing screens for high return in investment stocks. And maybe they should be starting to think about screens for low return stocks. Well, you will know the name of it. It's in this library somewhere. This is my library. Uh, the, the British government published a report on inflation accounting in the 70s somewhere which will be available now on eBay. And I think we should watch the price of that on eBay. And I, I think you're going to see it's going to start inflating quite quickly because it mentions things like that. But actually, there's a host of things where you just have to start rethinking how you value a, how you value a corporation. Uh, I would add, however, that I mean a lot of those profits were fake profits and you were taxed on them anyway. So uh, in the early 1970s, you know, things were out of control here. I think headline inflation was 22%. The corporate tax rate was very high. And as you reported fake inflation profits, they were all taxed. Actual cash flow, and this doesn't apply to all companies, but for some companies, cash flow was getting sucked out of these companies. And that process was called the doomsday machine. Uh, and it was run by a man that you and I both uh, remember very well called Tony Benn, who was quite keen to run a doomsday machine, given that it would catapult British enterprise into public control. So there are, you know, not a, I don't think either of us are talking about a level of inflation at that. So let's, let's be clear about this. Uh, so what we're talking about has some of these marginal effects. But if you get up to that sort of level of inflation, then it's very difficult for any company because your, your cash gets sucked out by, by taxation. I mean, if you talk to anybody that was an industrialist in the 1970s, they always shake their heads. Obviously, particularly in the UK, because it was a disastrous period in the UK up until 
um, was it 1976 we went to the IMF? Um, and, you know, I had a, a call um, very recently with a, a very well-known industrialist, and I talked about this um, idea of inflation, and I could hear him on the other end of the line shaking his head because he, he remembered how difficult it was. And, I, you know, when I was on the south side, I used to follow P&O, and the chairman of P&O, Lord Sterling, told me about the 1970s when he used to go around collecting the rent on a Friday because they, you know, they had their senior management making sure that the rent was in because other it was hand to mouth, week to week, day to day. And um, it's kind of frightening. This is the really important thing. We shouldn't pretend that inflation is good for equities. You know, we're, we're talking a, an element of the equity asset class and which, which element could have seen more protection. But for equities as a whole, this is not a good thing. And obviously, if it's 3 4%, not so bad. But if it starts getting to 7 8 9%, there isn't evidence that equities protect you from inflation as a, as a whole asset class. And of course, the, the best example of that is the 70s. And I'm sure it'll be online somewhere. And everybody who's watching this should read it. An article that Warren Buffett wrote in 1977 for Fortune magazine called How Inflation Swindles the Equity Investor. So that's very much a bottom-up view, but it's really worth looking at in terms of what happened to margins, what happened to effective tax rates, and why equities didn't perform during that period. It wasn't just that interest rates went up and valuations came down. But some of the reasons we've touched on, it actually became very difficult to retain cash and, and grow cash and reinvest. So the early stages of inflation are pretty reassuring, but in the long run, Equities are not the place to be. Equities in the whole are not the place to be. So what we're talking about, maybe heavy asset companies, maybe Japan, we're looking at a subset of, of equities. So I'm very bullish on equities because I think we're in the early stage reflation. That's working out all right at the minute. But, you know, this depends where we're going to and how high it's, 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 going, it's going to get. Well, of course, um, if we are in for a period like that, then you can't put your money in bonds. So... You've got to put your money somewhere. And it's funny what you, you mentioned Buffett, because I read that I read that article this week to preparing for, the, for this. And I also read his 1980 letter. And he said, well, you know, if you look at the not the book value, but the adjusted book value of Berkshire, including the market value of the quoted holdings, we've done quite well because we've increased at 20.5 percent per annum from 1964 to 1979. So this is the 1980 letter. He said, we would pat ourselves on the back, but in 1964, a share of Berkshire bought you half an ounce of gold. And today, it buys you half an ounce of gold. And you think about that as one of the best performing companies. It's quite, quite remarkable. But the, the other thing I just wanted to touch on was if we're in a high inflation environment, and it doesn't need to be 8%. Presumably, we need to avoid companies that have a lot of labor cost. There are two reasons for that. One is the labor cost will be rising quite rapidly because we'll get, I assume, and you tell me if I'm if, if this is right, but I assume we'll get that labor push inflation. But the other thing is, and I think it's really relevant today, is pension deficits. Because if you start to increase the inflation assumptions in the calculation of, of the pension liability, those pension liabilities are going to go through the roof. And of course, discount rates aren't going to go up. So yeah. is it possible that there's a sort of ticking time bomb in those companies with uh, big workforces and ticking time bomb in the pension deficits? Yeah. So as you know, I run this course called The Practical History of Financial Markets. Both, both of these are issues we, we cover in that. And I think the fascinating one in the post-World War period, you ask anybody, certainly in the United Kingdom, why do we have inflation? Certainly, if you go down to the city of London, they say, oh, it was a union. So it was, union. it was all to do with the unions. The unions caused the inflation. There's quite a lot of statistical evidence that actually what happened is the inflation caused the unions. It was kind of the other way around. <laughs> I mean, all of us want protection from inflation. Uh, and if we lived in a world where there isn't inflation, we don't need to unionize to uh, protect ourselves. But when inflation comes, that's when people go back to, to unionization. So, Steve, one day you and I will be forming the analysts' union. So I'll, I'll look forward to discussing that in the, somewhere appropriate when the time comes. And uh, the second point is, I think, an absolutely essential point for all of us to, to think about. 
when we in, in the in the practical history course, when we look at the things that make corporate profits mean revert, you would point towards rising labor that we're discussing, rising interest expense, which we're discussing, rising corporation tax, which we're discussing, uh, rising uh, cost of goods sold, which we're discussing. But historically, we kind of never thought about the pension scheme. Because in the long sweep that we look at in terms of that data for mean reversion, the pension schemes weren't, you know, they only come along really aggressively after World War II. And of course, really, you get to the sort of, they're building up into quite a big liability just as interest rates start to decline from 78 to today. So for those of you people who are not familiar with uh, pension fund accounting, that's how you value your liabilities. And, uh, you know, suddenly the liabilities are going up if the interest rates are, are, uh, are going down. If we now cap interest rates as inflation goes up. And remember, quite a few of these pension liabilities are linked to inflation. They're usually capped, usually about 4%, not 12 or 13. Then suddenly for the pension, we, one of the reasons we might see corporate profits mean revert is because such a large percentage of cash flow has to go into the pension fund. You know, if you look at the assumed returns that pension funds put in, some of them are putting in seven or 8%. There is nothing in the price of bonds, nor equities for that matter, which would give you any, any inkling of hope that you're going to get a blended 7%. So if we begin to uh, force people to take a realistic outlook in that, and crucially, the interest rate isn't allowed to go up, so the liabilities don't come down, tons of corporate cash flow could be pouring into these, uh, uh, into these uh, pension schemes. I used to be a pension fund trustee, so I used to say to our actuary, what because the actually every actuary in the country spends most of their time in the meeting saying to the uh, the uh, the trustees don't worry interest rates are going up liabilities are coming down and i would say to him well what happens if interest rates don't go up but inflation does go up and the most normal answer you get from an actuary is well that's not possible uh, and of course in a market system in the economic textbook it isn't possible but in real life it's absolutely being possible and it's and it's going to happen again so uh, i'm glad you raised the, the pension issue uh, but I, particularly for a lot of European companies, uh, I think there are big pension legacy issues, which the market is not really paying enough attention to. Uh, and we could also, and I will be in the next report I'm writing for clients, uh, looking at the uh, the life insurance industry, particularly of Northern Europe, which on these numbers, I mean, it's been in deep, deep trouble for many years because of where interest rates are. But in a world where interest rates stay low and inflation goes up, you know, we, we're looking at a, a crisis for the savings system slash pension system, uh, particularly for Northern Europe. So this doesn't sound like a very pretty picture all round. I mean, it sounds pretty awful. I'm just watching an interview with Evelyn Waugh from 1960. So we're, and we're kind of saying this is kind of a repeat of the post-World War II. And he made this, uh, he claimed to be broke, claimed that he didn't have any money. For those of you, you who don't know, he's another famous English author. And... Uh, the interviewer said to him, but, but Mr. Wall, you made a fortune selling books before the war, before it was taxed away, to which he replied, that's true, but I spent it all. And no honest man has been able to save money since 1945. Uh, in a world where the government's telling you what to do with your savings, it is incredibly difficult. So, uh, you know, that's why the top recommendation is find jurisdictions where the government isn't going to tell you what to do with your savings. And that isn't easy, but that is the type of world that we now live in. I mean, one place you can go would be commodities. Another place would be energy because you own real assets. I mean, to what extent do you think that will be hampered by the whole move to ESG? I mean, interesting. I listened to a podcast with um, Peter Harrison, the CEO of Schroeder's. Um, I'm a bit behind in my podcast queue. The, the, the interview was recorded last March, and I just listened to it a couple of weeks ago. But he said something quite remarkable. He said, um, in five years, the term ESG won't exist. And by that, he meant that it'll be so ingrained in every investment managers, every institution will have that as an integral part of their, of the, of, of, of their, of their process. If that's the case, I mean, is that the opportunity for the, for the little guy, the private investor? Because... No professional fund manager will want to be seen owning big oil or indeed oil stocks and oil demand will continue. And there's a, an opportunity for the little guy to actually profit from the, from the fads and the fashion by, by buying real assets. 
Yeah, so just when we're talking about real assets, I mean, I'll just do 10 seconds on residential real estate. That That is, to me, the key real asset, which is easier than this. We're going to have a discussion which is really quite complicated and has a lot of moving parts. I think the, the case for residential real estate, in a world where wages were maybe going at four or five, bond yields were two or three, I think it's clearer, uh, probably even clearer in America, where outside of the homes of the plutocrats, I think property is very is very cheap. So that's 10 seconds in that. Maybe we'll come back to that. Uh, in terms of commodities, there's lots of commodities which we need and lots of commodities which we need for the green revolution. That's the kind of irony of this. We're, we're about to live through a huge investment boom. Uh, a series of investment booms, actually, one associated with getting us green, one associated with us buying more stuff from somewhere else other than China. And I think another one associated with shorter distribution chains, which is linked to China, but actually is, is supplementary to China. So three investment booms are very good for uh, commodities and ultimately will be good for the planet. I mean, ultimately not bad for the planet. I think if we're you know, given one of the things that's been going on for years now is people have been, been moving their polluting industry to China because there's no real control. So this, if we are bringing stuff back from China, I don't think we're going to go, go easier on the pollution regulation. So that is an investment in commodities to save the planet, despite the fact the extraction is inherently and necessarily uh, not that green. So I don't know to what extent we'll really want to clamp down on that in the first, in the first, in, in the first uh, instance. Uh, and just one thing, if we, there's one obvious thing that we shouldn't be digging out of the ground anymore, and that's gold. Uh, I mean, I do realize it has its practical uses and uh, you can't have a wedding in India without it. That's a crucially practical use for gold. But on the whole, uh, I think ESG means it's going to be more difficult to get gold out of the ground, which makes it incredibly bullish for the gold that is out of the ground. And I say out of the ground because, as you know, it comes out of the ground very briefly and then goes back under the ground. So the whole ESG thing, I think, will not be as bad for commodities as we expect, number one. Uh, and number two, it could be particularly bullish uh, for the price of gold. I mean, we're talking to commodities. I almost hate to mention this, but the history of inflation is really the history of commodity inflation, including food inflation. And the reason I don't want to mention it is it is disastrous if the savings of the world flock into food because a lot of people go hungry. But that is what's going to happen and arguably is already happening. Now, it may be that the governments have to ultimately try and stop people's savings going into food, but it's a very good example of what can happen when you get to a tipping point in inflation, when people consider that their savings are better off in consumables than in what in a savings asset. And that's called the velocity of money. And that's when the velocity of money starts going up. So food is a good one. I mean, if you, if you think back to the Weimar Republic, who made all the money in the Weimar Republic? Farmers. Uh, not just because they were selling food prices that were going up like this, uh, it's because they had, you know, they had quite a lot of debt, long-term debt over their farmland. So they did spectacularly well. So let's not forget what might happen to food prices. So rather than saying you should go out and buy a lot of food, which is obviously not going to happen, there are lots of companies in the world who might benefit from somewhat higher uh, food prices going forward. So we should find some land in, a, in the right country, agricultural land in the right country. But what, um, just going back to residential real estate, um, I was trying to recall, your, you, you wrote this very good piece, Solid Ground, um, in 2016, talking about financial repression, and you talked about capital controls. Wasn't one of the, one, one of the issues in the past when we had financial repression, didn't we have rent controls? Yeah, so that, that is definitely an issue. And they have come in in Berlin, they've come in in Vancouver, and they've come in in Toronto. So you can't rule them out. So you've got to be very careful about this. I think that's one of the reasons I favor American residential real estate, because I think while it can happen in America, and it has happened in America, if you've read that report, you'll know that Mia Farrow was still paying something ridiculous like $2,000 a month to rent her, her, her apartment, rent-controlled apartment uh, up on the Upper East Side. Uh, but I think in some countries, it's much less likely than others. So I'm prepared to, uh, to, 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 to do that. When I... I started my career as a lawyer in Belfast, and uh, I remember traveling up to a place called Coleraine, and there we were doing a rent control review for a very old lady who'd, who'd got her rent controlled in 1948, and in 1987, she was still alive, still there, and still paying her 1947 rent. So for people who don't know what rent control means, begin to think of the consequences of that for the capital value. In fact, there were some, and I've just been speaking to one, there were some people who were putting so much money into the renovation of the property that it costs more than the lease. Uh, let me give you another example of why property isn't necessarily the way to go. Uh, Continental Can owned a building in Wall Street in the 70s. 
New York was not in a great place in the 70s, but property taxes were very high and it couldn't be rented. So they knocked it down. It was cheaper to destroy a building on Wall Street than it was to keep it open. You couldn't get any income of it and you were paying property taxes. So you knocked it down. So, you know, it's back to this, where we keep coming back to, Steve, we have to think very differently. So I'm happy to invest in US residential real estate on the basis that we want to rent controls for the average citizen. And that could be wrong, but I wouldn't be so keen to do that in Paris, for instance. Do you think governments will introduce price controls? You, in that article, you talked about the, was it called the Office of Price Control under under Nixon? I mean, it seems almost unimaginable. But then I didn't, I wasn't aware that they, I mean, it's not that long ago, 50 years ago, that we did that we did have that. Do you, do you think that will happen again? Do you think anybody who voted for Richard Nixon thought he would introduce price controls? I mean, that's the point. I mean, as you know, he sat with McCarthy sat on the, he sat with McCarthy on the anti-communist trials. He was thought to be extremely to the right of politics. So why on earth did he bring in price controls? You do what you have to do. Or as a certain gentleman has famously said, whatever it takes. Hmm. So I know there's a lot of speculation about what the Democratic Party might do in America. I don't think it really matters that much. You know, politicians under extreme pressure do extreme things. And I wrote in that article that the first man to head the Office of Price Control was another famous communist called Donald Rumsfeld. And Donald was so busy in his first few months, he needed help. So he hired another famous communist called Dick Cheney. You know, so the idea that Nixon, Cheney and Rumsfeld got together to control prices tells you that in a crisis, anything is possible. So am I saying we're going to price controls in the next two, three, four, five years? Highly, highly unlikely, I think. Highly unlikely. But at some stage in a inflationary movement, is it possible? Of course it's possible. And most people who've never heard of it will say, well, why on earth didn't they just raise interest rates? And the answer is they thought it would be too painful. Pretty simple. I mean, Nixon knew that by raising interest rates or persuading Arthur Burns to raise interest rates, he could tackle inflation, but he knew what it would do to the average American. So instead he went for... For price control. So I guess the answer to this is never underestimate the ability of politicians to make the same mistake all over again, but usually giving it a different name. But I suppose the justification this time will be that we've all got so much debt, every country in the world, government debt, and as you say, private sector debt, that you can, can't really afford for interest rates to go up by much. And therefore, what well, I mean, what else can they do other than introduce some form of price controls. So there is another thing you can do, which is called credit controls instead. So back to our kind of my opening statement here that most of the money in the world is created by banks. So if you and I as the government controlled the banks and we said, look guys, this year you're only growing credit by 6% and therefore the growth in money supply was growth to 6%, inflation should be you know, pretty low. Now that's another way of doing it. The history suggests that we end up getting a mixture of both, both of those. Uh, but it is worth remembering that the way inflation was controlled post-World War II, particularly in somewhere like France, was not by using interest rates and not so much by price controls, but by controlling the banking system, the governments managed to control the growth of money and keep inflation somewhat, somewhat in a, in a, in a balance. That's it, I think, in terms of how you can control inflation uh, without using interest rates. Ration, rationing is another one, but I don't think we'll get to rationing. But presumably that um, controlling the banks, will that work? for multinational companies is one companies just borrow overseas. So you obviously have to stop that. I mean, in the, if we're doing it in the United Kingdom, we're only interested in sterling lending because only sterling lending really contributes to our GDP. So controlling the sterling lending would be easy. If they started borrowing euros, selling the euros and bringing it in, well, as long as we control the supply of sterling, it really wouldn't make uh, any difference. So I think it's possible uh, unless you've got banks prepared to take huge kind of currency risks to, to run a sterling book borrowing it in, in Europe. So there, there are commercial limits on that usually, but ultimately you can stop them from doing that. And that obviously we had capital controls after the war. So that was not an option, uh, not an option at all, but normal commercial procedure makes that quite a risky venture. Not that, not that our banks are averse to a bit of risk, of course, every now and then. You've said it, it's, this isn't going to happen tomorrow, obviously. It's going to take quite a long time for it to unwind. What's your best guess on the sort of time scale for this? And what should we be looking out for? I mean, what are the signals? What, what are the milestones that we'll need to pass that will tell us, okay, now's the time to panic? So the only thing to me that really matters are bond yields. And that's what you should be looking at. 
So it'd be nice for me to give you a detailed time frame and a detailed end point. And you know, that's just a hostage to fortune. But it, there is probably more value in me saying, here's a level of long-term bond yields at which these things, these extreme measures are going to have to be taken. So I have done a very large report on that, and I won't go through all of the details in it, but the conclusions are pretty straightforward. That on the, and I'm looking at the five-year rate because it's the five-year government bond yield that probably has more of an effect on the price of bank credit, particularly for corporations. And the kind of argument is, at what level of interest rates would we trigger debt defaults because interest are so expensive? So the answer in America is roughly 200 basis points above today. That's quite a bit to go. Uh, we're going quickly, though, but that's quite a bit to go. Uh, for the United Kingdom, it's still 200 basis points. For the European Union, it's about 100 basis points. Uh, for Japan, actually, it's probably about 100 basis points, but obviously their rates are, are very low. Uh, but the fascinating one is China. It's only 100 basis points for China. I mean, I think in the, in the, in the uh, sort of the mess that we're in, we've forgotten that China also has a debt to GDP ratio just as high as the US, the United Kingdom, or not quite as high as Europe uh, or some places in Europe. So uh, those are the sort of numbers. So all I would say is we can live in, this is not a normal, I don't want to explain what's happening out the window today as normal because it's clearly very abnormal. But a continuation of this can go on till those interest rates are hit. When we start hitting those interest rates, then we have to go into the world that you and I have been discussing. And that is a world of control. Bull market in the word control, bear market in the word market, when interest rates reset to those, to those levels. And of course, I can't say when. That's, that's the difficult thing about the world we live in. When? I mean, I personally, if someone came up to then and sold me, wanted me to buy a 10-year treasury yielding two, I wouldn't take it, or two and a half, I wouldn't take it. But the market is full of people who seemingly want to do that, and uh, that will happen until the day it doesn't happen. Just um, to finish off, Russell, I mean, one of the things that I, I, I remember reading in the past about inflation, I think it was a Goldman Sachs piece, I, um, they said that when inflation got to above 4%, it, it had a massive impact on multiples. Multiples really contracted when inflation went above 4%. And I assumed that that was simply because interest rates went up. Now, if we get above 4% and interest rates can't go up, won't people think about equities as being real assets, companies that have real productive capacity, and be prepared to pay up for them anyway? He said they can't buy bonds because in the old days, when in inflation went above four percent, interest rates went up, and you got more more interest in your money. If that's not the case, is it not possible that we're in a, in an era of higher inflation, but equities don't go down? So there's a, only a long answer to that, I'm afraid. So I also have written exactly the same thing, and I wrote that in 2009. It said buy equities, buy them today, and hold them until inflation gets to 4%. And it turned out to be pretty reasonable advice. And we look at this in the course as well, and we also conclude that when inflation goes above 4 that is problematical. And the reason it's problematical is the one you've mentioned. The central bank tends to jack up the short-term rate, and that is a higher discount rate to create a lower growth rate. And if you want something that's bearish for equities, you have a higher discount rate, a lower growth rate, your NPV comes down. So that's pretty obvious. Therefore, is there a jurisdiction where when inflation goes up, interest rates don't go up? And the answer is yes, it's Hong Kong. Hong Kong runs an Angola currency board system. So it effectively always imports US rates. So you just look back at history and say, was there a time when inflation in Hong Kong was going through the roof and interest rates were coming down? And the answer is yes. And that was in the early 1990s. And you're absolutely 100% right. What happened to the price of equities? They just went straight up. And I was fortunate enough to, to live through that giant party, which, uh, t which ended actually at the very end of December. 1993. So it begs the question, well, isn't that exactly what's going to happen again? The, the problem is how we keep interest rates down, how we manage the yield curve. That's the crucial thing. If it's going to be done by central bankers, then I think you're right. I think, I mean, I don't know if infinity is the right valuation for equities, but if it's going to be done by central bankers, equities is the place to be. But we've got to imagine just how mad it would be for central bankers to do that. You and I are selling our government bonds because we believe inflation is coming. And then the central bank, in response to that, commits to two things, never raising interest rates and producing an infinite growth in its balance sheet. I mean, it's the route to hyperinflation exchange rate collapse. Uh, and I really believe that none of them would be that stupid to do it. And I don't think any of them will be. 
And people say, well, look, they've been doing it for years because they're doing it for years in an era of low inflation. So you kind of get away with it. But when inflation comes back, you've got to stop. So in my opinion, the, re the way we cap these yields is we force savings institutions to buy all these government bonds at a yield they're told to buy at. And that is how we cap the yield curve. But that's the problem for equities. If it's that way of doing it and not the central bank way of doing it, then to buy all this stuff, they've got to sell something. There's lots of stuff they can sell, but the biggest thing in their portfolio after bonds or near bonds is equities. So that's why I, as the equity class as a whole doesn't benefit from this. You and I have discussed some of the operational issues that will come anyway at much higher levels of inflation. But within the equity class, as we've also tried to discuss, there may be pockets where you can defend yourself from this. So it really does depend crucially on how that yield curve is capped. And I can tell you that nine out of 10 fund managers think the central bank will do it. And I think the chances of the central bank doing it are about one in 100 because it is so dangerous and history shows it's so dangerous. So the market uh, is really riding for a fall here because they're convinced that the right price for equities will be infinity when a yield cap comes. And I think there'll be a lot of disappointment, to put it mildly, when they find out how the yield cap isn't forced. Russell, I think that's a great point for us to, to finish on. Thank you enormously. It's been a fascinating, really interesting discussion. Can you just tell people where they can, where they can find you? Well, I can actually answer that question for the first time because until Monday, I was not available unless you were a professional investor. So if you're a professional investor, you can go to www.eric.com. If you're not uh, and you're a retail investor, then there is an option now at russellnapier.co.uk. So there are, for the first time, subscriptions to the research available uh, through that. And we've finally, finally, after six years, found a way of doing it. Well, that's great. I shall look forward to subscribing myself. My name is Steve Clapham from Behind the Bounty. Thank you very much, Russell. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.